God bless each of you. Um, it's so, it's, it's so, so good hearing that. Uh, would you mind coming up and just doing that one more time? Just, <laughs> just say Dr. Harris. Uh, so, so it happened this past Wednesday that um, I, I defended my dissertation, and the way the process goes is you, you, when you, you go down to defend uh, your dissertation, there's several uh, already doctors who are there in the room, professors, and they're asking you about your dissertation, and you have to defend, you know, why you did what you did or what you said, and then they excuse you from the room uh, for an eternity, <laughs> and, uh, and then you wait until they come out and, and, you know, invite you back into the room. And so I'm, I'm there waiting. I'm in a room with no clock, so it's like... <laughs> This is intentional. You guys are tormenting me, and so then the the chairperson of our of the doctoral uh, doctor of ministry uh, program at Gateway Seminary he comes out to get me. He says, "Dr. Harris, we want you to come on back in." I was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's 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 cool. So this is my first message as as a doctor, first Sunday preaching. Um, yeah, so. I hope you like it. <laughs> well, I'm grateful for the relationship I have uh, with you guys here at The Rock, and I'm grateful for Pastor Brandon inviting me to come today and for uh, just connecting with Pastor Bob. And I know Pastor Mark from when he was at Liberty Church, which is where I'm at now. Um, but the rest of the staff, uh, just to get to know them over the past few, few months, you guys have a great, great team here. And so um, I'm just blessed to be a part of this, this series on this Sunday on life in the kingdom and uh, finding triumph in your test. Um, and what I want to do today is to, um, is to share a perspective. Um, I've had several uh, bad days in my life. I've had several times and seasons where I felt like I was walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And there are also times where you have those mountaintop experiences, too. You know, life is just filled with the ups and the downs, the good days and the bad days. And those, those, those trials that come, those, uh, those things that seem like you're being tested. And one of the things that I have learned, learned, learned is that one of the most important things for you to have when you're going through anything is a proper perspective of who God is. If your perspective of who God is is warped, it makes what you're going through that much more complicated um, because you have a foundation of deception while you're trying to find the truth. But on the other hand, if you have a healthy view of who God is, then he can be all he is in that particular season. And you can lean on him, you can trust in him, and, and, and you can find in his presence and in his words everything that you need to navigate you through those tough times in life. And so in this, this series of Life in the Kingdom, I want to I wanna talk about um, uh, God as our Father. God as our Father. And now the last time I said, we talked a little bit about the, the importance of our heart and, and, uh, and growing in God from our heart and not just our mind. We can have a lot of head knowledge and know a lot of scriptures and still not be more like Jesus and still not love people. That's not his intention, but he wants to transform us from our heart. But one of the things I want to do today, and I feel like this is where God's leading us, is to emphasize for all of us uh, the, the, the picture and the relationship of God as our Father. You'd be surprised how many Christians say, I, I have no problem with Jesus. I love Jesus, but, it, but I, I just feel distant from God. That you need to recognize that as a crisis. That, that's an emergency. That, that, that There's an urgent situation there that I think uh, hopefully will be much more clear as to why by the time we finish uh, in the next few hours. So, um, <laughs> yep, not a joke. So one, one, the thing is that as, as, we, as we get into this, um, I want you to really reflect in your own life are you comfortable with God as your father? There are other names we find in the Bible, Elohim, El Shaddai, the most high God. 
know, all these different names. We know he's a creator of the heavens and the earth. We know all those kind of things. But, but the word father, uh, sometimes that is one word that oftentimes we trip over. Uh, and some of us uh, uh, think about the word father as, as, as a wrong F word. And sometimes it's due to our own relationships with a human father, whether that human father was completely gone and absent, uh, or whether that human father was present in such an unhealthy way you wish he was gone or absent. Or sometimes that father was abusive. Sometimes that father was critical. Sometimes that father was controlling. Sometimes that father was manipulative. And I will say, as an aside, it's not all just human father issues because you can have a mother the same way and still have the same problem. The issue is that these human relationships that we've experienced can cause us to have some baggage we carry into our relationship with God, and now we attribute things to him that aren't his. We attribute things to his nature that's not his nature. But it's easy for us to transfer that if we have human father issues, and then he says, I want to be your father, and you're like, nope, I don't need another one of those. So there is in our country an issue of fatherlessness. But they don't recognize which father is missing. God is the father. And if you've had a negative experience with a human father, God will be a father to you in ways that are way different than your human father. And if you had a good relationship with the human father. I mean, obviously, nobody, nobody is perfect, but you can still have a good relationship with your father because he was a good, a good father. So it's not that all of them are, are struggling, but, but, but some, of, some of them were really, really good fathers. Uh, even, even so, uh, the danger there is thinking that, um, well, let me just put it this way. They're still inadequate as it relates to God being your father. Still can't be compared. They're still human beings. And so what I've learned, though, is that as we are trying to get into this whole Christian thing, and I'll talk about that word in just a moment, but as we try to become followers of Jesus, we have in our mind what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Right? We're told we want to be just like Jesus. We want to say what he says, be like him, look like him, all that kind of stuff. But we miss something very, very important. And I want to show you what, what that is. So I want to invite uh, Pastor Bob to come on up here. Um, Pastor Bob, he, he's going to represent God. Yeah, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's a good looking God, isn't he? Good looking, good looking God. And uh, I want to get um, another person as well. How about, how about you right there? Which, we invite him, come on up. You're going to be Jesus. You're going to be Jesus. <laughs> Jesus with the gauges. <laughs> What's your name? Brandon. Brandon. All right. Nice. This is my father. You know, when I was looking at you, I was like, I think, isn't that how, that's cool how that worked out, didn't it? <laughs> oh, this is awkward. Okay, so that might change the illustration just a little bit, but we'll, 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 we'll see. All right, so, so I want you to stay there. I want you to face me, and, uh, and then I want you to stand right here. I want you to face me. All right, so, so we have God the Father who, who sends God the Son to save us. Okay, so from the very, very beginning, when God created humanity in the Garden of Eden, we had perfect harmony. We were connected. Uh, before the fall, before sin into the world, Adam and God, we, we hung out. We, en we enjoyed each other's presence. His presence felt like home. But after sin, when God's presence came, Adam hid. He hid from the same presence he used to find refuge in. And so because of this gap now between God and his creation, uh, uh, humanity, uh, God is not satisfied with this gap. We weren't created to, to, to exist with a gap. We weren't created to experience shame. We weren't created to experience rejection and guilt and anger and rage and pride and lust and, and envy and jealousy. We weren't, we weren't created for an, any of that. And so God was wanting to bring us back into relationship because God is not just God. He's a father. He's a father. 
And so we see through the whole gospel story that, that the plan that God has to bring us back into relationship with him, the, the apostle Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. He, he talks about if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Right? All things have passed away, all things have become new. And he says that those of us who have, who have been reconciled to God through Christ now have the ministry and, and message of reconciliation, right? But he says, God was in Christ reconciling the world, watch this, to himself through Christ. And a lot of our experience as followers of Jesus, is we're, we're focusing just on Jesus. Now, understand this. Is he worthy to be praised? Absolutely. He's the son of God, and he is God. He's the lamb of, that, 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 that is worthy. Uh, uh, Revelation says, to him who sits on the throne and unto the lamb. Be all honor and majesty and power and dominion, both now and forever, is his. He, he's the one who's faithful and true. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes, he's worthy of worship and praise. However, when the Father sent Jesus to the earth, he didn't send Jesus to teach us how to be king of kings, though that's what he is. He didn't send Jesus... To, be, to the earth to, to teach us how to be Lord of Lords, even though that's what he is. On the other hand, he is a son of God. That's what he's teaching us how to be. The Father sends Jesus to not just reconcile us back to the Father, but to give us a picture of what being in relationship with him looks like on the earth. And so, so as a follower of Jesus, if I just focus on Jesus, oh, I love Jesus, I adore Jesus, I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to read it and study his words, we're, we're, it's not that it's wrong, it's just not complete. It's not complete. You and I will not, cannot mature as sons and daughters of God without working on our relationship with God. So, I'm not just making all this up. <laughs> We've got to look at the words of Jesus. If you look at the words of Jesus, you'll see that Jesus talked about his father the entire time. The entire time. So, he says things like, I want you to face them now. Now, every time, every time I say father, I want you to point to your father. There you go. Good, good practice. Good practice. Which... Should be natural. I, the first service I had Mark here. That was just kind of weird. <laughs> so Jesus, he says, I and my Father are one. When Jesus' disciple Philip said, hey, Jesus, when are you going to show us the Father? <laughs> Jesus said, Philip, are you serious? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When people were trying to, to, to challenge Jesus and, and trying to doubt him, he says, he says the, if you, are you mad about the words that I speak? The words that I speak are not my words. They're my father's words. And if you don't believe my father's words, then just believe, believe the works that I do. But the works that I do, they're not my works. It's the father working through me. He says, he says, another, another situation, my, my sheep hear my voice. The, the, the Father gave them to me, and they're in my Father's hands, and no one can take them out. He told the woman at the well, she's like, uh, hey, you know, you Jews worship God in Jerusalem. We worship God on this mountain. And Jesus says, he says, he says woman, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me break it down real quick. <laughs> the time is coming and is here now where the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth because the Father is seeking them to worship him.
when he was telling his disciples, hey, guys, I got to re get ready to go. I'm getting ready to go back to the Father. And when I go, the Father's going to send the comforter. As a matter of fact, before I go, let me just give you a little insight. Uh, in my father's house, many rooms, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. That where I am with the father, you will be also. Are you seeing the picture here? So... It's kind of ironic that oftentimes we put our focus just on Jesus, but then we miss what Jesus is saying the whole time. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. <laughs> so do you see how not knowing God as your Father is a problem? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, let's stop right there. You're the way. The way to who? Mm -hmm. You know, when I came from Fairfield to Roseville, I didn't get on Highway 80 and say, man, I'm glad I made it on the way. Jesus says, I'm the way, not the destination. He's the destination. When you're in your home, apartment, condo, house, and you're going, you're, you're, you, use, you, go, you walk down the hallway to get to the room, do you just stay in the hallway? Or use the hallway to get to the room? So a lot of us, they, we're, we're having a party in the hallway. <laughs> I made it to the hallway. <laughs> made it to the hallway. I love the hallway, right? It's, no, the purpose of the hallway was to connect us. The Father sent him. Right, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his son. On the night before Calvary, what was Jesus praying? Hey, Father, uh, listen, I know initially Calvary seemed like a good idea at the time. But it's tomorrow now, if it's possible. Uh, have we exhausted all other options is, is it possible to let this cup pass from me? It was the Father who said, it's not possible. It was the Father who said, the cross is necessary. It was the Father who said, son, your blood has got to be shed. Why? Because the Father was one to sacrifice his son to have more sons and daughters. <laughs> that he doesn't want to just have a party in the hallway, but to get all the way to the room. So what ends up happening, what ends up happening is this. I'm going to invite Ryan to come on up here real quick. Now, Ryan's going to be the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so when I come out of this world of darkness, you know, when I come out of this world where the, of, of the club scene where it's all dark and people are depressed, and now I go to church and people just they got all the lights on and everyone's happy and smiling, right? I'm, I'm, I'm into a new family. I need help teaching me how to be into a new family. Because now what the Father has done in Jesus, he's put me in Jesus and Jesus in me. I'm in a new family. So things are different. The things I was afraid of there, I don't have to be afraid of here. The things I had a desire for there, I don't have to have a desire for here. The things I felt inadequate about over there, I, I have fullness over here. The things I didn't have over there, I have abundance over here. But that, I don't know how to do that. So the Father sent a helper. So the helper teaches me, oh, follow me, how to be in this relationship. And it's different. One of the things Paul said 
the Holy Spirit, he bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He tells us you're a child of God. He reminds us over and over, you're a child of God, you're a child of God. But I'm afraid of, no, 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 we don't do fear. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't do fear. We don't do fear. Fear was over there. Over here, we got your back. We don't, we don't do fear. We don't do fear. Right? Well, I just think I'm, I'm just, I, people bother me. I, they're just not as good as me. Oh, no, 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 we don't do pride either. No, we don't do pride. Don't do pride. Um, you couldn't save yourself because you were that jacked up. You're not better than anybody else. The same grace you receive to be in the family, you need to extend to those outside the family. So the spirit renews my mind and the spirit changes my heart. The spirit helps me operate from the family. Now, there's something else that the Spirit does. So, follow me. Sit down here for now. So, all this talk that Jesus had about the Father, he says, oh, you're on it, man, I love it. He says, he's like, well, I just got one job. I got one job, one job. <laughs> all this talk about the Father. After Jesus goes to the cross because it was the Father's will, right? He said, not my will, but your will be done. Okay, not my will. There was a different will there. Not my will, but your will be done. Sons submit to the will of the Father. Sons of God, daughters of God, we submit. We can have our own will, but we submit it, even if it means Calvary. That's another message. But so, so, so he says, he dies on the cross. And even on the cross, he says, Father, into your hands, I give you my spirit. I give you my spirit. He gives up the ghost. He dies on the cross. He's buried. And on the third day, what happens? He was raised. Somebody else said he was raised. Somebody else said he got, yeah, yeah. Others say he got up. No, he didn't just get up. No, he was dead. He didn't just get up. He was raised. Why is that important? Because he was raised by someone else. The same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in you, right? But it's the father who raised the body of his son by the power of his spirit. And so when Jesus... He comes back, and he's in the garden, and, and Mary sees him, right? But she doesn't recognize it as him and this whole thing. And, and, and Jesus says, Mary, and Mary's like, oh, it's you, right? She wants to hug him. He says, oh, can't hug me yet. I have not ascended yet to my father. So then he, he, she, she, he says, go, go tell my disciples I'm going to see them. Like I told them I was going to see them. Tell them I'm going to see them. So he ascends to the father. He comes back. Well, watch what happens in John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus pops up in the house with the disciples. They're scared. He pops up in the house, didn't use the window, didn't use the door, just pops up and says, peace be unto you. It's like, hold on, Jesus, wait. Don't tell me about no peace be unto me. You just, that ain't cool what you just did. Like, you didn't, like, you, you didn't knock, you didn't, you're just going to pop up and talk about, like, peace be unto you. No, you were dead, bro. You were dead. You were dead. Don't just pop up and talk about some peace be unto you. Isn't that weird that sometimes the time, I mean, angels pop up like, Fear not. Like, forget that, man. Hold on. I need a minute. I need a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. What is happening right here? So Jesus says, so he's speaking to me as a follower, right? He says, peace be unto you. Watch this. And I want you to point to him. Oh, uh, God, I want you to point to Jesus. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, now, Jesus, when you point to me, I'm sending you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Now, in order for me to really grasp what it means for the, the Son to say he's sending me, I have to understand how the Father sent him. What did the Father send him to do? Well, we know to, to live, die, shed his blood, and be raised from the dead and, and all that, but... 
Like he said in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In, in, in Colossians, Paul says that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. And the reason why, through Jesus, we can see the heart of God is because Jesus obeyed God perfectly and fully. And so through the actions of Jesus, we can see the actions of God. Through the words of Jesus, we hear the words of God the Father. Through the heart of Jesus, the compassion of Jesus, we see the compassion of the Father because he's here to represent tangibly, visibly, the Father. So when I, when I, when I see him, I can see the Father. Now, if Jesus would have came down to earth and went rogue, like, oh, I'm on the planet now, I'm doing what I want to do. No, if, if Jesus would come and do what he wanted to do, then we would see it different. We wouldn't be able to see the Father. We wouldn't be able to see his actions, his heart, his intentions. We wouldn't be able to learn about him. He had to do what he said so he could represent him and show him to us. So when I see Jesus, I see the Father. Now watch this. As the Father sent him, so he sends me. So point to Jesus again. Jesus, you're pointing to me. And now I'm looking at the world. And I should be able to say, if you've seen me. But I can't do that on my own. Man, if he didn't send the spirit to be with me, I would be jacking this thing all up. You, look, if, you, if without him, if you've seen me, you've seen me. Right? Right? It's the spirit of God who is Christ in us. That's why Jesus said, it's better for you that I go. Because while I'm still here, I'm, I'm here in the flesh, and I'm limited by the flesh. But when I go back to my father, the father's going to send another comforter, and he'll be with you, right? He'll be in you. So now the, the spirit of God can be Christ in me and Christ in you, which you couldn't do just in the flesh. So now, like Paul says, it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me and gave his life for me. And so the Spirit of God is Christ in me so that when I see somebody, watch this, when I see somebody who has changed genders, when I see somebody who is a victim of trafficking or the offender in trafficking, when I see somebody who is crooked in, in politics, in education, in whatever, when I, when I see some stuff, I can't be John. Because all they'll get is John. The same way the Father sent Jesus for me, they need to know the Father sent Jesus for them. But they don't see Jesus, and they don't see the Father. They see me. So I've got to do what he said to do. So his will is represented here. His heart is represented here. And when people experience me, they can experience the Father. They can experience Jesus. They can experience the Spirit of God. They can experience the full Trinity through me. If I obey, if I love, if I let him make me like him by the plan of him. The father is the executive producer of the entire gospel story. <clears throat> Starring Jesus and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and, they've, and they've come to teach us how to be here. But to let, so now that I've, I, I used to be an, an orphan, now I'm a, a child of God. I'm in a family. And what children of God do is share the message of the gospel with orphans so they can know because the Father's heart is for them. Amen? All right. Y'all give it up for the Trinity up here. Y'all make a great, make a great Trinity. <laughs> so, 
Spiritual maturity is all about learning how to be in the family of God. Learning that our prejudices and our stereotypes and our judgmentalism and all that other stuff. No, we, we learned that from our brokenness. We didn't learn it in the family of God. This brings us to the story I want to talk about today. Yeah, that was just the intro. <laughs> I told you I wasn't a joke. Several hours, it wasn't a joke. But I want to share some principles from a story um, that most of us know pretty well. In Luke chapter 15, sometimes people call it the lost chapter because everything in the chapter was lost. Not that we can't find it. It's still between 14 and 16. But it's, it's oftentimes called the lost, lost chapter. Jesus begins talking about things that were lost. And the reason why is because in the audience, I mean, to really get Luke 15, you got to get who he's talking to. In the audience, there are Pharisees who feel like they're high and mighty above everybody else because they know the Old Testament, they have memorized big chunks of it, feel like they, they live according to the law better than anybody else, so they feel like they're like the religious elite, and they always try to challenge Jesus because Jesus elevated others who are downcast. So they try to challenge Jesus. And then there are also the scribes, right? these, these religious rulers. In the same audience are people who are called the sinners and the tax collectors. Uh, different classes of people according to uh, man's um, designation. So Jesus, Jesus is trying to get them to see the Father's heart. He tells three parables back to back to get them to see the Father's heart. That's why I went through the whole introduction. So you can see what Jesus' mission was about. Yes, he came to seek and to save those who are lost because the Father sent him to get them. Yes, he came to, to heal the brokenhearted, to, to declare freedom to the captives, to, to open the eyes of the blind. He came to do all those things. He came to save us because that's what the Father wanted, to, to bring us back into relationship with him as a father who wants his children back. And so he tells this parable. He says, there was a shepherd who had 100 sheep. One sheep wandered off, and the shepherd left the 99 to go get the one sheep and to bring that one sheep back. And when he found that lost sheep, he brought that sheep back, and he told his friends and neighbors, celebrate with me because the sheep that was lost is now found. I found him. I got him back home. Celebrate with me. One out of a hundred. And then he tells the story of a woman who lost a coin. And, and she searched her entire house looking for this coin frantically, like not stopping until she finds this coin. Because we're not talking about a coin like you find before, you know, when you clean your pockets, try to before you wash your jeans and stuff. We ain't talking about those kind of coins. This, this is a bridal, a bridal necklace that had ten coins in it. And to lose a coin, you are not walking outside with a coin missing. It's the equivalent of losing your engagement ring. So she's looking frantically, and she didn't have, you know, tile or hardwood. It was a dirt floor. I mean, so she's sweeping, sweeping, sweeping. And when she finds the coin, she celebrates. She's so happy that she found the coin. She tells her friends and neighbors, celebrate with me because the coin that I lost is now found. And then Jesus tells the parable of the father who had two sons. Jesus was such a brilliant teacher. Look at the progression uh, from the first story to the last. First, one out of a hundred is lost. Then one out of ten is lost. Then one out of two is lost. Then there's also the progression in value from a sheep to a coin to a son. And in this parable, Jesus talks about a father who had two sons, and the youngest son requested of his father his share of the inheritance. Father, give me mine. Give me my share of the inheritance. Like, that's it, it, a bold request for what you didn't work for. 
And all the audience would, their, their, their mouths would drop when they heard that because they knew how offensive that was for a son to request the inheritance of his father while his father's alive. Secondly, it's the youngest son, so you're like second in line. Inheritance will go to the oldest one first. So, so already, this son, uh, people have a negative view of the son, like this guy is arrogant, his heart is just in the wrong place, and so Jesus tells a story, and the father, the father gives him his share of the inheritance, and the son goes off into a far country. He wastes everything that his father had given him on whatever else he w was doing, you know, maybe he's at, the, at the bar, and hey, the tab is on me, everybody, and, and like he, he's good time Charlie, everything's on him because he's got it to spend, and then it runs out, and then there's a famine that hits the land, and the young man goes, and he, the only thing he can do is find a job uh, feeding someone's pigs. Again, in the Jewish culture, to have contact with pigs is like grotesque. So here's this young man. He's now feeding pigs, and as he's feeding pigs, the food he's feeding the pigs looks good to him. He's so hungry. And this is when, in the story Jesus tells, he says, the son came to himself, he came to his senses, and he said, you know what? Even my father's servants are better off than I am. I'll go back to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. You ever rehearse your speech before you said it to somebody? Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please hire me as one of your servants. Right? So, so this son knows that he, is, he really should be in so much trouble that his best hope would be that his father hires him as a servant because surely his relationship as a son is over. So he goes back. He goes back home. And what this son doesn't know is that every single day the father went out on his porch and he looked off into the sunset. He looked at the horizon hoping, is this going to be the day today? Is this going to be the day that my son comes home? And one day, as a father is looking out on the horizon, he sees a silhouette. You know how sometimes if you can't see a person's face, you can recognize their walk. You know what I'm talking about, right? He sees the son. He recognizes his son. And the father runs out to grab his son. Now, what you got to know about Jewish culture, the men don't run. Because it's hard to do with your tunic and robe and everything, right? So you would literally, you have to pull it up and Flintstone it all the way. <laughs> so they didn't run one because it was awkward and two, it just didn't look cool. The audience knew that. Watch this. The audience knew. They don't run. So to hear, the father ran. He ran. And he didn't say, oh, that's, that's my son. Well, wait till he gets home. I've been waiting to rub this mistake in his face. I've been waiting to let him know how he wasted what I gave him. I've been waiting. Wait, wait till he gets home. I'm not going to go out to him. I'm going to wait till he gets right here. I'm going to let him come all the way and feel the guilt and feel the shame. That's what some of us would do. Some of us have done to our own kids. But not the father. The father looks, he has compassion. He runs out. He runs to meet his son, and he grabs him, and he kisses him, and he hugs him. And when you read the story, the son, he goes, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. And the father goes, throw a party. He's back. He's back. My son is home. Kill the fatted calf. He's a, son, squash the speech. We ain't here for that. I'm glad that you, I don't care what you did with the money. I don't care what happened in the far country. I don't care. I don't need you to rehearse everything. I'm glad that you're home. That's what's important to me. You're back. You're back. You're back. You're home. It's party time. I don't need a whole repentance speech. You're home. This is repentance. You smell like you've learned your lesson. <laughs> you look like you've learned your lesson. See, sometimes repentance ain't what we think it should be from our religious perspective. 
Oh, sometimes people quote unquote repent and they use words with no heart and it means nothing. And sometimes it's heart with no words that means everything. But when you come to God in tears, you might not know what to say, but you've come to him and he'll take it from there. Oh, he'll take it from there. That's the heart of the father. And people call this parable the story of the prodigal son. It's not the story of the prodigal son. Jesus didn't tell the story so folks could learn more about making mistakes. He told the story because he wanted to reveal something that they didn't know. It's the heart of the father. This is the parable of the forgiving father. Not the prodigal son. The forgiving father. That's what it's about. The seeking shepherd who go after that sheep. The seeking woman searching until she finds a coin. The forgiving father who welcomes the son back home. So the son, the son comes home and, and there's a party at the house and everyone's like, yeah, 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 he's back. And so, but, but the, the oldest son, he was out in the field and he was working. And as he was on his way, he's like, what's the part, what's this whole party about? One of the servants says, oh, well, your, your brother uh, who was gone, he's back home. And so the party is for him. He's like, what? So then the father learns that his oldest son is out back, doesn't want to come in. Watch this. The father goes to him too. This is hard. Son, what's wrong? Dad, I've done everything you've ever told me to do. I followed all the rules. Religion. Religion is never excited when someone else receives grace. I followed all your rules, and you've never even killed a goat for me to have a party with my friends. And the father says something amazing. He says, he says, son, you have always been with me. Watch this. And everything I have is yours. You're so focused on what somebody else is getting, you lost awareness of what you already have. Everything I have is yours. Because I only had two sons, and he just blew his part. <laughs> Everything's left belongs to you. <laughs> I didn't cause you to miss out. That's, that's orphan thinking. That if someone else receives, then it's something that I'm missing out on. It should have been given to me. Even the son who obeyed all the, listen, who obeyed all the rules still didn't have his father's heart. Still didn't have his heart. Still didn't have his heart. You can obey all the rules, guys. You could lead ministries, plant churches, pastor churches. You could be an apostle, bishop, whatever. And love the rules. Still not have his heart. And so the Father has sent Christ to reveal the Father. And then Christ has sent you to reveal Christ. But he doesn't want you to do it all out of religion. He wants you to do it out of a relationship where you, your heart has been changed to be like the Father. Where you don't have to watch your mouth. Because it's not in your heart to begin with. He wants you to be like him. Or compassion is the first response. Love, mercy. So why would the Father do all this? Because he loves us. And this is why it's important. Listen, guys, this is why it's important for you to give the Father the credit for everything that he's done because it reveals who he is. You can't grow in your love for God as a Father without seeing what he's done for you as a father. Yeah. 
And so when you have this kind of perspective on God as a father, and I've only talked about his heart a little bit and the, the, the forgiving nature of him, but there's so many other things to his nature. But I use this as an example of how through Jesus' teaching, he talked about the father. He wanted people to have an accurate view of his father. When you have an accurate view of, of our father, then when you go through difficult seasons of life, you know he's the one to run to. You know he's the one to count on. You know he's the one that you need a word from. You know he's the one that will be your shelter. He will be your refuge. You go to him instead of running from him trying to find a shelter in something or someone else. Jesus came to reveal the Father. And then he says, as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. When you look out and see people in all kinds of sin, blue collar sin, white collar sin, sin everyone knows about, sin no one else can see, it's all people who are trying to navigate life separated from their Father. And they need compassion and mercy not religious judgment and fingers pointed in their direction. And look at what you did. Look at what you did. Look at what you did. That's not the kind of father we have. And so I'll leave you with this as I think about closing. <laughs> in, in John chapter 17, I encourage you to read the entire chapter. Jesus praying to his father. Guys, read that. That's just your homework, okay? Read John 17. He says this. If you can imagine them up here again, Jesus is praying to his father. He says, Father, I pray that they know that you love them as much as you love me. we believe that? Do we know we're, we're that much in the family? I want you guys come on up and play and yeah, play some, some good father music. <laughs> Just play meditationally, meditationally. Meditation, I know the word, y'all. Y'all like, did he just say? What's that word he just said? In Romans chapter 8, man, guys, the Father has lifted us to a place that we don't get. You, you, can, you can only, that's why the whole heart thing is, because is, it doesn't all make sense. But right here, you can experience the truth and power of it. He's given us so much. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, Abba, Father, right? And in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, we've been given the spirit of adoption whereby we can cry out, Abba, Father. You mean we can call God the same thing Jesus calls him? Do you know how close we are to God now? You ever, anyone here have like a nickname? Maybe you got some nicknames. Some of, you like, some of them you like, some of them you don't like, right? But maybe those ones that are in terms of endearment, right? If someone calls you that name, maybe you don't even see their face. You already know their, their relationship with you. Because only certain people call you that name. Only certain people call God Father. That's why Jesus did what he did. That's why the Father, he wants us fully restored, fully restored and fully transformed to look just like his son. Let's all stand.
Guys, I'm encouraging you to spend time with the Father. Uh, it was a few weeks ago, Pastor Ryan was talking about um, uh, an encounter with God. And in this encounter with God, God took away so many things from him. All right? Just took it out, took it out, took it out. Because he does those kind of things spiritually. And sometimes the things that God does spiritually are overlooked because it wasn't sensational. Well, I don't feel anything. Bump that. You, you ain't here because you want to feel something. You want to be free, right? It, 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 is the result freedom or goosebumps? Which one you want? <laughs> if you want goosebumps, we can put the air condition up. You can get that for hours. But if you want freedom... He can, watch this, he can do it, and you don't even have to feel it. He, it's, it's spiritual. And everything that is significant is not sensational, but it can be effective. It's your heart, it's your heart, it's your heart. To see him as a forgiving father. Who want, he just wants your home. He just wants your home. He just wants your home. You got to tell the whole story. No, he just wants you home. <laughs> Father, I said, ah, 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 party time. <laughs> party, party time. Ah, ah, you're here. That says enough. That, that is repentance. So some of you today, you need to come home. You need to come home. And it's not, it's not to me. It's to his heart. What does coming home look like? That could be getting saved for the first time. You just go, man, I, I get this. But it could be you trying to live carnally and deciding that's not the route you want to go. Come home. It could be you came here today feeling so much guilt that you want to thought, man, I'm just going to sit in the back. No offense to those sitting in the back, but... I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to call. You know what I'm saying, right? I mean, okay, let's get, get back in the spirit, y'all. Get back in the spirit. But you know what I mean? Some of you don't even feel like you can worship. You see people in their hands up like, no, nah, I, I, I messed up this week. I can't even lift my hands up today. He just wants you home. The altar's open for those of you who just want to come home. And you can say to the Father, I'm not going to repeat a prayer for you. I'm not, nope. It, it, it's come from you. So whatever that means for you, if you just feel a tug in your own spirit, I want to respond to this message. And I don't even know what the Father's going to do. I don't know. I just know I want it. I, I want it, whatever it is. I want it, whatever it is. I want you to come. I want you to come. We'll just take a moment and just... Just come in. Like the song earlier, I'm not, we're not here for blessings. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you. We just want you. And I invite our prayer team to come up and just lay hands on people. Stand behind them. Let, let them feel the Father's acceptance through your hands, through your hug. Let them feel the Father's heart. Whisper things from the Father into their ear. Just pray for them. Just pray for them. Just pray for them. I'm going to relinquish the, the mic to Pastor Bob, and we'll just go from there. But I know uh, John doesn't need this, but let's thank him for, for coming and just uh, bringing that word. That was well done. We know you're a doctor because you make up words. That's good. So that was good. I mean, I'm going to listen to that one many, 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 many times. Yeah. So, Father, we thank you. We can call you Father. We thank you that no matter how far we've gone, we can come right back. Pray for every person that comes forward today they would receive the Father's embrace. They would be saturated by the grace of God 
and their hearts would be established by grace. So we pray your blessing on this prayer time right now. We pray a blessing on every person in here is weak. As they leave these doors, God, may we represent you well in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. So be it. Church, you're dismissed. I love you. Have a great week.